18 Dynasty. The 18 Dynasty is a large Necron dynasty which rules many tomb worlds on the northern galactic rim. Despite being ruled over by the Ferran 18, his power is shared among his powerful and loyal Necron overlords. The dynasty is known to contain many ancient wonders of the galaxy. Despite its large size and being next door neighbors with both the Novok dynasty and the Oriska dynasty, not a lot of information is known about the dynasty as a whole. In fact, their capital planet, Ignorus, has more information than the dynasty itself. Ignorus was a former Imperium frontier world that was discovered to also be a Necron tomb world. In 784 M41, the Aten dynasty awoke on Ignorus and found to be populated by annoying brats. So like all things Necrons, they got down to business. As settlements began to vanish one after another, the world citizens promptly shat themselves and retreated to their only spaceboat located in the coastal city of Inmoran, where a riot soon erupted around it. Just then, however, 18 warriors rose from the nearby sea and, led by a blazing god of light, began kicking the trespassers a new one. Just as all hope for Ignorus surviving population seemed lost, by the act of Deus Ex Machina, a lone imperial knight out of fucking nowhere suddenly appeared and defeated the invaders by driving the metal warriors back into the sea. However, the settlers plot armor did not last that long. By late M41, though, the Necron rose up once more and conquered Ignorus. Now that the world is in their grasp, Ignorus's Necron have begun advancing towards the gothic sector. Despite the best efforts of Fort Excalibur's kill teams to stop the Xenos. Charnavok Dynasty. The Charnavok Dynasty is located in the eastern fringe and is known for one thing and one thing only. They got wrecked by Tyranids when they were still sleeping. Their crypts have been overrun by the burrowing organisms of the Great Devourer. Somehow, despite being made of materials inedible to Tyranids. To make matters worse, many of their tomb worlds have been defiled by the Imperium and wise settlers building high upon a foundation of slumbering doom to come. Unfair, I know, but such is life. Thus, the leaders of the Charnivok dynasty are getting their shit together and reclaiming their shattered power and glories. Because most of their core worlds were destroyed, it is safe to assume that their Ferran also kicked the bucket when he was sleeping. Thus, the dynasty is currently in the hands of various overlords and necron lords who both self-govern their respective chunk of the dynastic territory. They then establish diplomatic contact with one another to avoid further unnecessary interstate bloodshed. Similar to that of a federation, the dynasty is currently marshalling its remaining forces with only the strong having survived their misfortunes. As the lords and overlords put aside their petty differences, they are finding their mismatched legions are still pretty damned elite indeed. The livery of the Charnavok dynasty honors the Koryu Urals lost to these attacks, with all of their warriors bearing the colors of night unending to some degree. The more prestigious the Necrons rank, the more of this deep blue adorns their carapace, with Ferran folk's entire frame clad in midnight blue. The Charnavok symbol represents the original three Koryu Urals and surrounding outer planets of the dynasty although only a small fraction of these worlds now remain. Still, despite the devastation, the Charnavok dynasty is a pretty large entity, albeit scattered and fragmented. Although each of these physical territories are smaller than Ultramar, if taken together, their astrological territory has proved to be one of the larger Necron dynasties still around and kicking. They just need to get their collective jimmies together and form a cohesive leadership first and foremost. Their current capital is Bardic. Main Arc Dynasty. Featured in Imperial Armor Volume 12. The Fall of Orpheus as the main antagonists. The main arc dynasty brings back the good old days of pre-fifth necronosome scariness while keeping the sense of tragedy and crazy personality of the Neucrons. These guys managed to take down half an imperial sector and the Angel's Revenant Space Marine chapter in a hundred days. Somehow kidnapped the Orpheus Imperial Governor driving him crazy without anyone else noticing such a feat and wiped out most of the sector's Imperial fleet in one single battle. Plus some exterminatist planets and moons. It is unknown the true scale of the dynasty. Although it is generally agreed that the main arc's core Urals do not lie within the Orpheus sector proper but beyond the veiled region from which no human explorator is believed to have ever returned. They have also erased a Cetan from existence, 
They did it properly, not the half-acid fragmentation. They have a bloody cryptic who attempted to destroy time itself black hole weapons. Nuff said also. Flayed ones as troops as they are slowly succumbing to the flare virus okay. That may not be that awesome but at least they are no longer in the elite slot. On the other hand, if they ever get the vanilla flare update. So yeah, these guys are totally hardcore. Notable members. Zunbaki, the mother of Oblivion. Ferak, female Farron, of the dynasty. We may assume she was Yandir for Zarek the Silent King. How else do you explain her getting a seat and permanently killed Maclan Cutlack, the Necron version of Angron? He seems to be infected by the Flare virus but hasn't devolved yet. No politics for him. There is only war. Achieved a mutual kill with Asterian Moloch, but then Asterian got better. Tohok, the aforementioned cryptic who tried to destroy time itself. Seems like Zunbaki didn't take his experiments well so she ordered him tortured so he can no longer fully regenerate his necrodermis. This makes him blind and the guy now sees in distorted temporal energy and works in keeping Maynark weaponry fine and running. Landuga, the Setan which was killed by the Maynark dynasty. No, we don't know how this happened. Neither do the other Necron overlords as causality itself was damaged. Or just Zunbaki Yanderism for Zarek getting more done than space Egyptian technology. Some other dudes like Ike Satatek, the Jackal Regent and Lord Hunter of the Void and Tlazel the Faceless, Nemezer of Tayrock. Sadly there isn't really enough background aside from their names and titles. But considering how crazy the other characters were we may assume they are made of win and what. Questions with. Out. Answers. Will we ever get a mini for Zunbaki so we can finally see what a Ferak looks like? Maybe some art. Even though it's probably no different. What is the older and scarier than Necron's thing which was entombed in the Caracol system even though it's most likely a Setan? We need some answers. Why did the Silent King put so much care into protecting the main arc dynasty? Is this a confirmation there was really something between him and the Ferak? How did Tohok plan to destroy time itself here at 1D4 Chan? We would like to try it too. Why is it that the Necrons didn't kill more Setan if they could actually do it? Our spiritual leaders declared they are part of the fundamental fabric of actuality so we may guess removing all of them will irremediably damage the universe. Then again they completely destroyed the flare setan and all that did was give the necrons the flare virus alternatively killing the flare setan actually did damage the universe but it happened so long ago no one remembers what exactly had been damaged and how much better the undamaged universe was on the other hand some characters of 40k have pointed out how their universe is not just indifferent but actively hostile, perhaps this was the everlasting result of the death cry of the Setan or something. Dunno. Dunno. We are just some humble neckbuds grasping at stuff too terrible to understand. Would Trazin attempt to steal Zunbaki's closet? That's probably already done. So just what is Thamaris? Mefret Dynasty. The Mefret Dynasty are a dynasty of the Necrons. They are known for only three things. The first is that they are literal next door neighbors to Bale and its inhabitants. The second is that they are renowned star destroyers. Their current territory is located in Ultima Segmentum. The third is that their Farron was destroyed whilst in stasis, leaving the dynasty currently leaderless. Add a fourth to that, their color scheme is literally the same as the Cameron's Terminator. During the war in heaven, the Mephrid dynasty specialized in stellar destruction, harnessing technology capable of turning stars supernova. The Silent King frequently turned to this dynasty to bring troublesome worlds to heal. Even though most Necronta felt their methods ran counter to their codes of honorable warfare, which is ironic given the Necronta's war with the old ones which can be summed up as a bunch of assholes shooting up an old folks home. An old folks home populated exclusively with immortal wizards more powerful than Gandalf who previously beat the Necronta in war. To this day, the Mephrid mastery over stellar phenomena is evident in their weaponry, which are powered by the energy of captive suns. This in turn, somehow turns their gauze weapons bright orange, which should technically make them into plasma weapons more than anything else really. Nonetheless, fortunately for the little youngins, Eons of having a great snooze fest without proper maintenance meant that the dynasty either lost their super weapons from sheer temporal entropy or through hundreds of millennia of disrepair and thus, 
and suitable for eliminating the dust buildup within Tomb Worlds, let alone wartime. Geez, if you thought the Cog Boys in Red were pretty bad at preserving their shit together, the Mephra got them beat in the responsibility department. Seriously, what kind of idiot leaves their star destroying doomsday devices laying around unattended for 60 fucking million years the Farron of the dynasty? Kirok the Eternal was lost during the Great Sleep, which is again, ironic given his name, destroyed during his slumber along with the entire crown world by those pesky elder assassins leaving the awakened dynasty leaderless. It's also mentioned that a Hrun infestation of the crown world was responsible for its loss, which may be a conflicting history or an addition to the total destruction of the planet itself. Either way, this has led to the lesser nobility vying amongst themselves for power, each hoping to wrest control of the dynasty and reclaim some of its lost glory. Overlord Zerathusa the ineffable Akka the scary bastard with the giant orange scythe is currently poised at the forefront of this politicking. The territory of the dynasty is currently located in Ultima Segmentum, and includes the tomb worlds of Perdita and Karakatosh. Mephrit's dynastic symbol was originally intended to reflect the constellation which surrounded their crown world. However, the march of time and entropy have left the current formation of the empire unrecognizable compared to its former shape. Although not as large as the Oriska dynasty and the Nexus dynasty, the Mephrid still has more screen time, information and relevance than either of those two. Recently they have been warring against Kraftworld's Alatok and same hand for the Exodite worlds. Known individuals, Esendrak, Executioner and Herald of the Red Harvest Kirok the Eternal, former Farron. Got blamed by Elder Assassin Zarathusa the Ineffable, Overlord of Perdita and current runner-up for next Ferran's Urgin. Critic Nekthist Dynasty. The Necron Dynasty that really shows its age. Little Rust Buckets. One of the larger Necron Dynasties. The Nekthist Dynasty have earned the reputation as the that guy of Necron Dynasties. Yeah, you heard us. For a race that brought us plenty of a shollish trollish characters such as Traz in the Infinite. Illuminus Zerus, Azagorod, Mephitlin and Imitek the Stormlord. The Nekthis dynasty is known to be on a whole nother level. They're a dynasty of Asholoteps without the fun side. Apparently, way back in history, their ruler pissed off the Triox for not being orthodox enough and just being complete dicks about it. Farron Iblis the Enslaver and wisely and proudly, angered the Triox by refusing to adhere to their decrees. Thus, when the Nekthist's crown world of Mobius came under assault by a colossal dose of karma in the form of an orc wag, the Triarch refused to rally to their subjects' aid. Though the orcs were repelled, Mobius was devastated in the ensuing battle. Along with much of the Nekthist's once glorious empire, not improving their already abysmal reputation most likely. Ever since that particular petty tantrum, the Nekthist shunned all concepts of honor and verity and instead, replaced it with all-around dickishness and chronic backstabbing disorder. Seriously, the amount of alliances this dynasty broke is unaccountable, to the point where they make the marines malevolent look quite restrained in their team-killing actions. As such, despite these events having taken place millennia ago, they are never gonna unlive it down. Since they are such edgy fuckwards, the Nexus shunned their pretty gold and purple heraldry with that of Harsh black and copper carapaces that embody their jaded cynicism. They fight ruthlessly to preserve their shattered domain, using any and all methods, no matter how cruel or underhanded, to preserve their legacy, which isn't much considering. Though technically subjects of the greater empire, the Nekthist are seen by the other Necron dynasties as little more than untrustworthy doucher bags. The symbol of the Nekthist dynasty is a stylized diagram of their original hierarchy. An organization they seek to expand until it covers thousands of star systems. Nefrek Dynasty. Praise the Mithafik in Sun Yuo. The Nefrek Dynasty also known as the Blingrek Dynasty. The Goldrek Dynasty. Golden Necrons. Blinkrons. Pimpkrons. ETC is a dynasty known for three things. The first is that they are an entire dynasty covered in gold. The second is that these Mithafikas are as wealthy as a corrupt Saudi prince and the third is that they have a completely off his rocker Ferran that is both ridiculously awesome and ridiculously dumb. As the Nefrek dynasty is an extremely wealthy one, 
Its worlds are rich in the precious metals used to construct its legions. The location of the dynasty's territory close to the galactic core in Ultima Segmentum also grants it access to rich energy reserves, enhancing the strength of its armies. The dynasty itself is located in a trinary star system which in itself, is located in a cluster of stars that gave the planets so much of the precious moolah. Heck. These guys are so knee deep in sun juice that their translocation beams can literally lead their armies from one system to another at the speed of light. Of course we can't continue talking about these guys without mentioning their partially insane Farron. Their leader is called Farron Silphek, who like so many others, emerged from his long hypostasis within his crown world with his personality degraded to Kim Jong-un levels of funny ludicrous. For one thing, he has become so consumed by an obsession with the stars themselves that he announced to his bemused court that he wished to drape himself in their molten glory, which makes him the first Necron to be a sun bro in order to stay on their leader's good side. The cryptics made a skin of living metagold that can turn to pure light through advanced hyperalchemical processes so that the Ferran can praise the sun whilst his minions can also praise the sun. Ferran Silphek has now come to the point where he basically for all intents and purposes, deified himself as a living god. Still, those mommy looks aren't for show. The dynasty's high-ranking overlords can be temporarily transformed into living light. While even the lowliest nephric warriors can activate traces of metagold within their metal bodies in order to shift and stutter across open ground at unusual speed. You know gotta go fast and all the secret to making this process permanent yet eludes the nephric. But they have bent their formidable resources towards solving the conundrum. The dynastic symbol of nephric consists of three overlapping circles. Reflecting the three stars orbited by Arand its crown world. However according to other sources Arand is now under the control of the Ultima dynasty who enslaved the imperial settlers who had occupied it in the years of the Great Sleep. Since the Great Rift's creation, the Nefrek dynasty has become involved in an ongoing war with several invading Thousand Suns warbands from the Cult of Time. These Sons of Magnus hope to uncover the methods the Necron used to turn the Setan into slaves. So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. Well we got you covered at nickbedgear.co.uk. One stop shop for coom jar models. However we do sell a lot more than just smart models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and dnd 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbedeacontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. Nihilak Dynasty. The Nihilak Dynasty is notable for their ridiculously scubby color scheme of baby blue and gold. Maybe they have a sense of fashion or maybe it is just G-dubs trying to shoehorn the space Egyptian theme of vibrant colors in a deserty landscape. Despite the absolutely bizarre color palettes, the Nihilak Dynasty like most Necron dynasties are dangerously xenophobic. However, some may say that their isolationism is a step up from your usual get off my fucking lawn personality from most Necron dynasties. Their reputation is quite pronounced. Whilst its isolationism is beneficial to alien races, it also carries a peril. Undepleted from wars of military expansion, the Nihilak viciously act against any interloper. If attacked, they do not rest until the aggressor has been utterly destroyed. Of course due to their isolation, very little is known about this peculiar hermit kingdom. In a sense, some may have ended up calling them as WH-40K's North Korea due to their isolationism and xenophobia, but there is already another state that basically functions as a North Korea in the form of the Scourge Stars. Recently however, due to the state of the galaxy, the Nihilak dynasty have ended their policy of isolation and have begun a campaign of expansion from their borders. The Nihilak dynasty itself is based from the crown world of Geddon under the command of the Ferran Crispec. Known worlds. Geddon Solemnance Cardrim. Taken by the Imperium after the Battle of Cardrim. 
seems to have understandably pissed off the Nihilak dynasty. Known individuals. Trizin the Infinite. Overlord of Solemnes Crispic, Feren Kepak Terek Drizion Novok Dynasty. The Novok Dynasty has been slow to awaken. But with every new and bloody war, its resurgence accelerates. Its warriors are invigorated by the act of bloodshed. For them, the mark of success is a deep and livid red. Codex Necrons Cornet Necrons that loves to rip and tear. No kidding. The dynasty has no known Farron. So it is usually jousted between two esteemed Necron overlords. Located in Ultima Segmentum, the Novok march to war in crimson livery echoing the bloody rituals of their past. For all intents and purposes, they get turned on by being showered in guts and blood. How kinky. The territory of the Novok dynasty is found in Ultima Segmentum and includes the crown world of Dolvi and the active tomb world Raven. The dynastic symbol of the Novok represents the six wars of conquest which emanated from the dynasty's original core. This is a simple design of the type often seen in aggressive younger dynasties. It is noted by being literally sandwiched by two large dynasties, the Aten and Oriska respectively. The Novok dynasty is currently fighting against numerous orc hordes. In terms of their modus operandi, a Novok phalanx will initially go to the front line with a slow and plodding gait like all Necrons usually do. However, when the close range killing begins, it harnesses the flickering memories of the ancient sex party's blood rituals it once performed. As the gore of the foe splashes across their carapaces and skull-like masks, they seem to come more and more alive until they are fighting with unnatural vigor and determination. Greatly reminiscent of the flayed ones except with a semblance of order and less chewing. The Novok dynasty has found a rising star in the form of Overlord Garmak. The moon killer. Garmak gained considerable fame before the great sleep with his obvious tactic of destroying moons, thereby disrupting the gravity of worlds that defied him. At the heart of Garmak's armies is an unusual Setan shard simply named the Crimson God. The Setan shard was enslaved by the Novok dynasty millennia ago during the war in heaven. The shard is commanded at all times by the redoubtable overlord known as the Crimson King which should not be confused with the other Crimson King from an equally Egyptian-esque army. An unwilling vassal, the Setan drifts ominously across the battlefield meeting out destruction with its incredible powers, but never quite in the way that the Crimson King would wish for. Much like a disgruntled housewife really. During a battle with the Death Guard warband known as the Pallid Hand on Hollowfall, forces from the Novok dynasty were infected by Mortarian's biomechanical ferric blight. The disease spread to their tomb worlds and have created a devastating epidemic which caused accelerated rust within the Necron armies, creating a robo-equivalent of smallpox. Ogdebek dynasty. The Ogdebek dynasty is a Necron dynasty famed for its technical mastery. As a result, its tomb worlds were more prepared with better backup systems for the great sleep after the Necron race rebelled against the Setan. They are also known for being sensible with a dash of just as planned. Unlike most Necron dynasties, the Ogdebek actually listened to their cryptics and were thus insanely prepared once their 60 million year old snooze fest is over. Seriously. They are like the only dynasty that actually thought in the long term and discussed with themselves. You could only imagine how that went. Hey Bob you know what would be a great idea that we actually have a contingency plan once we sleep for an unknown amount of time. Cause we don't like to wake up with some rude encounters eh therefore. For millennia the two factions existed in a technological symbiosis. With the vast resources of the Ogdebek core Urals given over in exchange for the war machines and canoptic constructs that allowed them to expand their realm ever further. Because of this, their power suddenly increased in influence despite their size over the coming decades. Whilst they were originally a minor power, they are now able to contend with other polities on their own. The Ferak of the Ogdebek dynasty, and the Throses of the Black Star was known for her paranoid streak. Perhaps due to the rather superior behavior of the cryptex that formed a large part of her court. At all times she surrounded herself with an army of canoptic constructs that could restore the glory of her legions should they be compromised. The twice dead king. Rain also revealed that she was originally a patriarch but sometime after her awakening, she became a matriarch. Neat. Her tomb complexes were built with triple layered backup systems which proved to be of immense value over the course of the Great Sleep, 
when the dynasty awoke, the vehicles, constructs and warriors of the Ogdebek emerged from their tombs all but intact. All this is damn fortunate for them and gravely unfortunate for the Imperium, as the territory of the Ogdebek overlaps with the Segmentum Solar, dangerously close to Holy Terra and staunchly defended by humanity. Despite this, they have made impressive gains since their awakening due to all their toys still having working parts. Thanks to them owing their success to their technologists in green, the symbol of the Ogdebek is a graphic representation of a cryptic's rod, partially eclipsed by the dark sun of unknowable mysteries. Ogdebek warriors are best identified by their copperish but not rusty looking necrodermis, unlike their much edgier cousins. The Nekthist Dynasty. Oriska Dynasty. The Oriska Dynasty is a large and powerful Necron Dynasty that are neighbors with the Novok Dynasty, Aten Dynasty and the Sortek Dynasty. They are also noted for only two things. The first is that they are bitter rivals with the Sortek Dynasty. While the power of the Sortek was spread wide throughout the galaxy, the Oriska's holdings were limited to a handful of ancestral worlds laden with technological wonders. So they remained incredibly jelly over Imitek the Stormlord's gains. The rivalry has not ended since the reawakening of the Necrons. Both dynasties are pursuing the wider goal of reclaiming the galaxy, but may one day come to clash with one another once more. The second is the sole fact that the Oriska dynasty is known to possess the celestial orrery on the tomb world of Thanatos. Yes. That celestial ori. This has resulted in long running siege by enemies in search for the device. First, the word bearers and next, fellow Necrons of the Cardinoth dynasty. However, other than that, that is all the available information for the Oriska dynasty. You would expect that a dynasty with such a weapon like the Celestial Ori would have more fluff right Celestial Ori and it if you all don't know what a Celestial Ori is. Think of it as a tool that trims the galaxy the same way as a gardener trims his bonsai tree. Except, instead of a small miniature tree, its entire star systems. This machine consists of a web of holograms and necrodermis with the various tiny, Floating, glowing lights representing a star in the galaxy. Each of these is recorded in an intricate matrix record that contains the locations of every star in the cosmos. So if the Necron Farron proceeds to control plus alt plus delete on a particular star system, it automatically leads to its physical counterpart undergoing a supernova millennia before its time that destroys all the nearby worlds that circle it. How this is done? We have no fucking clue. But despite such destructive potential, the Krons are surprisingly quite reasonable with a metric shit ton of self-restraint. Since the act of destroying a star must be done with careful consideration as it would upset the natural order of the cosmos that could create a critical chain reaction. Through further manipulation, any imbalance can be rectified and returned to proper balance though this can take thousands of years of constant precise micromanagement. Sortek Dynasty Of all the Necron dynasties out there in the galaxy, the Sortek Dynasty is the largest and arguably the strongest of the bunch. Currently ruled over by Ferenimitek the Storm Lord, consisting of 80 tomb worlds. Its crown world is Mandragora on the eastern fringe. In the times before the biotransference that transformed the Necronter into the Necrons, the Sortek dynasty was ranked third most powerful of all the dynasties. Through chance or design, many of the core Sortek tomb worlds survived the Great Sleep. Now, the Sortek dynasty is more powerful than any other and is quickly becoming a major threat on the Imperium's eastern borders. To the Imperium. The dynasty has become synonymous with the Necrons, and it is erroneously believed by many that they represent the alien race as a whole, with all other dynasties being mere offshoots of the Sortek. Its nobility is noted as being the most aggressive and the most eager in attempting a new wave of expansion to restore the Necron race to its former glory. They are known to frequently enslave non-human worlds. As of 8th edition, the Sortek dynasty has grown several times its original size due to the opportunistic absorption of multiple newly awakened tomb worlds, and is now the second largest political government in the galaxy, 
beating the Qual Swarmhood and becoming a serious contender to the Imperium of Man in superpower status. Only time will tell if Inatech manages to restore the Necron Empire to its former glory. The dynasty is so huge and influential that it has two client dynasties offering assistance and support for Inatech. The two dynasties are known as the Second Dynasty which is ruled over by Overlord Nasza and the Arimarok Dynasty which is ruled over by Overlord Zeron. As of now, the Sortek dynasty borders both Ultramar and the Tau Empire. The latter is considered by Imatek to be too insignificant to be of interest. The same cannot be said of Ultramar. As after the Smurfs victory in the Second Battle of Damnus Imatek swore to wipe out the Ultramarines and destroy their planets in order to punish them for their defiance. Known planets. Mandragora Jirim Somnus Grodina Vi Davitus Hypneth Canova Rithka in Medusa Vi Famous Individuals. Imatek the Storm Lord. Farron and Overlord of Mandragora Nemesis Andrek. Overlord of Jidrim. Old Coot and partially senile Varga Dobberon, current bodyguard and caretaker of Zandrek Auric and the diviner Cryptek Aramak, Overlord Cages Nahumek, Lord Navgrin the Eternal, Cryptek Ogdavak, Vassal Overlord Osoa, Cryptek Zarekan Dynasty. The Zarekan Dynasty was the dynasty of the last Silent King, Zarek. So you know these guys don't fuck around. Despite this, they were relatively slow to wake up despite the fact that they were one of the preeminent and most powerful Necron dynasties during the war in heaven. Moreover, all silent king over there decided to go on a 60 million year long exile over the whole being responsible for turning his species into soulless shells of their former selves thing. Which led the state of the dynasty to decay whilst others like the Sortek dynasty laughed their merry way to the top of the galactic food chain. Well, the good news is that the silent king is back along with the dynasty and Imatek the storm lord has some explaining to do. History. As aforementioned. This dynasty used to be one of the top dogs amongst the Necrons during the war in heaven. However, after that fiasco in murder ficking the old folks home and turning their gods into Pokemon, the last Silent King felt a bit moody and decided to pick most of his boys on an intergalactic camping trip for a 60 million year old break. Allegedly, he was seeking a way to undo the biotransference process, but we know fuck all about what that would have involved. Assuming it's even possible. For all we know, he was searching for a retirement home. Anyways, this continued until Zarek discovered that the local galaxy cluster had a bit of a pest problem, which alerted the Silent King to go back to his hometown to unite his bros back. Unfortunately for Zarek, leaving his house abandoned for 60 million years kind of made him into a negligent ruler, so his dynasty was promptly attacked by Elder and then by other embittered necrons of other dynasties who felt that the Silent King abandoned them. Whoops. Despite all this, once the rest of the necrons of his old dynasty heard that old big boy was returning, they immediately shat their metallic pants and paid fealty to Zarek, hoping that he won't shove a necrodermis power fist up their necrodermis asses. Famous individual said it's Zarek. The Silent King trivia. An interesting fact is that Zarek was so paranoid about the war that he basically pulled a blood ravens on the rest of the Necrons by hoarding all the Blackstone and implemented them on his soldiers. Yes, the most basic troop in the dynasty can resist warp attacks. Thoked Dynasty. The Thoked Dynasty is a Necron dynasty whose crown world is Migoshta, the cradle of war. The territory of the Thok dynasty is located in the Segmentum Pacificus. It rivals the Mephra dynasty in size, although it is far narrower than most active. Necron dynasties. They are known for their blue color palette which looks far more appropriate than the Nihilak dynasty. The shifting void of the Hirakii deeps of the Segmentum Pacificus hid the core Urals of the Thoct dynasty and their legions. The Thoct cryptics have fashioned rad receptors into the weaponry of their soldiers. Harnessed from the potent radiation of the sparkling blue energy that permeates the rifts in the sky overhead. Above the crystalline continent tombs of the Thoct. A symptom of this choice is that this barely contained energy causes a shimmering azure light to emanate from the eyes of Thoct Necron warriors, from their gorse flares and even the cracks in their mechanical forms. When the Thoct gather for war, the barely contained power of the Hirakii Void Rifts is ready to be unleashed upon their foes. Most recently, 
In 994 M41 the dynasty's fringe worlds were invaded by the orcs of White Blood Tooth. Entire worlds were turned into killing fields in order to grind down the orcs in a bloody war of attrition. Where they got their blueness from is due to the aforementioned radiation emitting void rifts. This makes the Thok dynasty unique in both appearance and culture. This can be seen in their iconography in which the Thok favor the cold blue of their crown world's immense void reefs. The Complete circles of the Thok dynastic symbol show the alignment of the Hiraki I deeps to the crown and core Urals of the dynasty's ancestral star systems. Famous individuals, Vothamit, G is sculptor to the Thok royal court.